And I mean, an initial point that's sticking out to me from towards the end of the reading is this diff of what he's saying, like giving people truth, like isn't gonna isn't gonna do much to combat like a lie that's more affective, I guess it's word. Um, and that like it needs to be something quote unquote more powerful, more perfect. It needs to affect them in a stronger way. I mean, I, I just, it was interesting to him saying like truth is worth kind of nothing in itself. Like it needs to be paired with, with something that has a strength effectively. Well, you know what that, that reminds, reminds me of and I, it is um, in the, in the Republic, uh, Socrates slash Plato, you know, that he's got this model of the soul and you've got reason and then the spirited feelings and then the appetites. And apparently one of, one of the points where Socrates and Plato disagreed, I'm not a Plato scholar, but this is what I've heard them say, is that Socrates thought that, it, that if someone truly knew the good, that they would do it. And Plato's like, no, that's way naive, that just knowing the good is not enough. And so, you know, so Plato has this, that tripartite soul and the uh, appetites can can drive us to do all sorts of things that are inconsistent with with reason but then because you know if i understand plato right the only at the the only um motive so reason does have an inherent motive force for plato you know that like when he talks about the uh the true philosopher has this at least in one my one translation this erotic love literally erotic love for the good the true and the beautiful so reason has a passion, or that's that's probably not the right word to use, at least from Spinoza's vocabulary. But any anyway, reason has this drive, but but it gets swamped out by the appetites, and so then the then reason has to have the assistance of the spirited feelings to do, in a sense, do battle with the appetites, and so you've got to have these spirited feelings. So I, you know, just the mere the mere attraction, the mere, you know, whatever it is, desire or whatever that reason has for the good, the true, and the beautiful is insufficient to, for, at least unless you, at least until you have a fully just soul. But if, you know, those of us who don't have fully just souls, that's, that is insufficient to guide one's behavior. So you have to use these, these uh, feelings like um, pride and indignation and these sort of hot spirited feelings, thumos, in order to discipline your appetites so that they don't cloud your vision and and drive your behavior so it kind of it reminded me a, a bit of that you know that the reason by itself just knowing the good is not enough to get people to do it but you've got to have some sort of affective component that can you know engage with that aff that affective aspect of your soul i like that i mean would we say Spinoza like advocates for that? I guess there's a part of me that like would want to read in him saying that of like truth is nothing by itself, but it needs to be, yeah, like recruit, recruit desire with it. And doesn't he at one point say, I can't remember if it was in him or in Deleuze, forgive me, but um about you know, like the mind body isn't competing, right? Like we don't. We don't lose out on the capacity of the soul or the mind by by giving into the body, but like they feed into each other. If we can kind of cultivate the body, the appetites, then this kind of allows us to better understand what a mind, what a soul can do as well, on top of what a body can do. I, I have a real hard time keeping that all that straight. <laughs> So, yeah, I get, I get, I get confused by the whole mind body thing. Yeah, so I think the to a certain degree there is uh some crossover with the the kind of uh platonic you know faculties and whatnot, except I think the uh Plato wants to make more of a kind of hardline distinction between these faculties and also well also he uh divides society as like you're intrinsically part of this one group 
that you know is dominated by this faculty that's your best thing you know um just mind your business doing your job uh yeah plato um spinoza i think he wants to do something um uh, you know it's kind of like okay yeah we got these appetites going on um but then how do we uh it's more about kind of working within uh, these different desires and appetites and affections. You know, desire is just what, uh, you know, your striving, your conatus is as it's determined by the affections that you undergo. The affections just being, you know, the ways that other bodies and, and ideas and images uh, actually affect you. And then uh, from that, you get your desire will be oriented towards certain, you know, objects or traces or something. So the idea is to kind of refine those to the point where you have um, you have desire that actually leads to something uh, for in a way. It's kind of a so he's, you know, very. Uh, critical of teleological arguments and whatnot for this he's saying like it's not teleological it's about efficient cause it's not final but he's saying like okay yeah if you can get that's okay the other thing so perfection this word uh it occurred to me upon reading the appendix or is it the, the no the preface to this section if first of all it's a perfect explanation of what we were talking about uh last week i mean it's almost like spinoza heard our conversation and responded to it but uh one thing i realized is he's using this according to the etymology of the latin so when he's talking about completing things and finishing things and he gives this whole genealogy of the uses and the senses of perfection as a word so in latin per means kind of through uh fection like fecere it means to do something to make something so it's talking about you know thoroughly doing something or making something and that's exactly what he describes as the first sense of it so i think that uh that makes a lot of makes a lot of sense uh why he's using that word if you look at the etymology of it and also it's interesting that that perfection you can also understand by looking at the etymology of that why it would lead towards these kind of these finalist teleological illusions of consciousness and whatnot based off you know a model that you have so if you have um whatever fits the model you know my conception of the model closely or most closely that's what i'll consider you know perfect so that's uh well it's interesting is he kind of he kind of adopts this you know uh but in this way where okay now instead of so we got these desires they're determined by affections so the point is to kind of okay let's have desires that are affected in a way where they actually are oriented towards things that actually increase our power of acting which was that's the thing that we're all kind of uh inherently essentially striving for anyways in this kind of uh self-recursive way where we're kind of like striving to continue striving to exist we exist by continuing to exist so i think uh that could compare to plato somewhat and socrates in the sense that so we're always kind of striving to increase our power which in some ways that's what is good in a very relative sense in a doubly relative sense it's not an absolute good but 
based off of how we're affected, we try to always seek or strive for this good. The problem is when we have uh, these inadequate ideas, uh, these, uh, you know, passions and whatnot, uh, we are often uh, inherently misled. So we strive after things that uh, don't actually help. And that's basically it. So are you saying that Spinoza is saying that re our reason is incomplete and so we're misunderstanding? I think so. He I think he he would say more that our affects, as long as they're these kind of passions. They give us inadequate ideas, confused ideas. So that leads us to oh. to strive for things that are uh, counter to reason. Okay, so you're talking. So this is the passions. Begging your pardon for saying this way, leading people astray. Yeah, yeah, I think you could say something along those lines. Yeah, okay. I guess Thanks. when I hear like passions leading astray. <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of translating that to my understanding of like when a man or when a human becomes kind of part of a relation that's not kind of necessary to its, I don't know if essence would be the right word there, or like its own power. And it starts kind of just almost like feeding the power of another relation. Um, and so, yeah, I guess like passion as in this kind of like something external has kind of recruited the human body into serving something else, um, which kind of pulls that human body away from its power as a human body. Um, and I guess, I mean, it's, I, I, I find myself kind of butting heads with this idea of, I guess he's talking about, we have different models of, of man or human. And I guess he's maybe putting forth a certain model I guess there's this kind of idea of what is Spinoza's adequate idea of, of the human or of a man. But I guess that's kind of his ethical question, maybe, is that it's ethical and that, like, I'm going to put forth a system that proposes we should live in a certain way and, and make an argument of why it would be good. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I think what he's doing is kind of the the model of all these things would be something like okay we're as individuals you know our our mode of individuation is, are these relations of motion and rest speed and slowness this kind of you know uh differential relation and that so that includes, you know, we've got all these parts going on, these simple bodies that he calls them, but they're not like denumerable. Um, did I say that word right? I think I said it wrong. Anyways, so we've got these relations, they need parts. And the thing is, so when we encounter other bodies, that's, um, if we can compose our relation, with the other body that's what is a, a good affect in this or a joyful affect and that's what enables us to kind of when he's talking about composing bodies and an agreement that we have to have you know this idea of an agreement between all bodies and minds that would lead towards you know one body and one mind acting and striving in some kind of unity I think that's his kind of um, vision of the ideal, I would say, is where things would be composed in such a way where the relations that we're constituted by would agree so that they're mutually empowering with each other. And where I think, um, Joey, what you're talking about as kind of so that's kind of like the the good vision of um, these larger like social bodies you could call them, 
but then there's also uh, other kind of social bodies, I think, that would be, okay, yeah, we can understand these for the members that compose it are actually disempowering. So this would be something where, you know, I don't know, think, I don't know, some, some fascist state or something. You know, it's definitely composing some kind of uh, those relations, those dynamic kind of movements and whatnot. They're definitely agreeing in the relations in some way. And there's going to be some kind of, you know, joyful affect that comes out of these things. But it's at the cost of a lot of, you know, uh, sad affects at the same time. So I think if you consider it overall, that it's restraining uh those bodies those minds from understanding then that would be uh overall considered bad in relation to the fact that those encounters instead of agreeing with each other they instead decompose and break down and then that's uh spinoza does not like that spinoza wants us to persevere in our being so yeah um when you were just talking chase I, 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 it's okay to jump in i didn't know if anybody had a i'm i'm thinking of the vocabulary that uh, spinoza has been employing and it's it's to me simple without being simplistic but i'm trying to think if he ever used the phrase self-discipline and just the way you were talking now, I thought that if about, you know, what he's saying and I apologize, I, I'm not, I'm not as clear as you, I'm not even one hundredth as clear as you are, but the, an odd statement, you know, if people did have these characteristics, then they could do certain things. And when you were saying that, it just thought, well, isn't that self-discipline? I, I mean, maybe before you answer, because I feel like maybe that ties to my question. And again, I didn't, I'm not caught up on our Discord. But when I saw him, like, I feel like he doesn't elaborate on it. But when he says something like the mind, like overpower, or rest, the mind restrains the passions or restrains the appetite. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. Because I guess when I my initial impression to Ed's question is like, does self discipline have any role when we're thinking about just everything's determined? I guess I'm trying to find some reconciliation with that. I was gonna read the first, the very first sentence of part four uh, in my translation says, "Human lack of power in controlling and restraining the emotions I call servitude," and and then the way he goes on to describe that it sounds like what uh, Kant would call heteronomy where you know the these a person is being pulled around by these passions but then but then the whole deterministic thing comes in and and i think you know based on some of the stuff that chase said and that we talked about last week if this is descriptive rather than prescriptive it, you know i there's a way in which i think I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing here, but because if he's going to be a determinist, there's a way in which you can call it self-discipline because part of the, you know, part of the mind body is dominate or is controlling or restraining another part of the mind body. But there's not a, there's not a, a, a volitional center in the sense of there is a me, you know, there is a, a, a Nevit soul atom as, as Nietzsche would put it, that is discipline or controlling other you know the rest of my soul it's just that there's certain aspects of the mind body that are um that are controlling other aspects at least that's the way and again i'm reading it kind of a, i don't know maybe too much through a nietzschean lens because that's the way i think that's the answer i think nietzsche would give but but it does you know i'm not sure how it you get you you retain his sort of deterministic framework without casting self-discipline as sort of a descriptive feature you know of what's happening in the mind rather than saying i am in control or i am controlling myself 
and, and again, before Chase jumps in with his answer, I want to say I, I have I've been having some of the same kind of questions, but I want to I want to say that some something more is yet to come because a lot of it seems to hinge on his distinction between inadequate ideas and adequate ideas. But that's I mean I can't explain much more than that. But I just I feel you know I, I gather that that's kind of important to to proffering an answer. Well, you know, that's another question I, you know, you know, again, just asking the same question is what role does that play? Because I get the impression that if that if you have a, an adequate idea, then you then there's no dis, there's no distinction between knowledge and action, you know, to, and so it's almost like uh, like 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 Socrates, he's agreeing with Socrates, but only to the degree that you really have an adequate idea, you know, to really know is to do if you really know. If you have an adequate idea, but then if to the degree you have inadequate ideas, then you're acting, you know, you're acting on insufficient information, so you don't really know. I, I guess the other thing coming to mind that feels somewhat related to this is I feel like there's maybe space to move in regards to like sadness and joyful, but I don't think we ever shed all passions or become quote unquote active. And I, I was trying to just look for it, but I think, isn't there a point where he says like, the idea of a man becoming like unaffected by external things is impossible. Like he's not, it's not infinite. Um, and so to me, it feels like the adequate ideas, maybe they don't kind of like break us free but maybe they, you know, push us towards increased power or joy, but we're still always, I guess, subject to passions and bondage to some extent. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so that's part of, so if you think about it, it's just um, the fact that you've got bodies kind of going around doing their thing in the the common order of nature as he calls it where so that's going to, he's going to give a eventually a kind of hobbesian argument and he's going to talk about the state of nature and what he's talking about there is this kind of so unlike a lot of uh state of nature you know uh social contract theorists or whatnot that would they're usually thinking or even appealing to what they thought was the state of nature in uh, the newly found continent, um, according to them, of America. But, uh, well, that's kind of debatable. Anyways, that's beside the point. So Spinoza, um, he's going to talk about it as these are kind of random encounters. There's no kind of organizing principle. So I would just kind of get bodies just randomly kind of uh, encountering each other. Their relations might agree, they might disagree, and we're kind of left to chance. And that's what he's saying. Okay, reason is what kind of uh, works. Uh, not so much against that, but instead to, instead of we have chance encounters that Maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be bad. Maybe it'll have some joy, maybe sad, I don't know. Instead, it's going to kind of organize the way that encounters can happen so that mo uh, as many affections as possible lead towards the agreement of those essential relations of things and therefore affects of joy and whatnot. So kind of reason would be the way of organizing encounters that leads towards this kind of, you know, his ideal vision of uh, bodies kind of agreeing with each other in this uh, one striving and one body, one mind kind of thing. Um, but uh, so I think a lot of the... Um, the distinction that was talking about um okay so I, yeah i think uh eric first brought it up yeah the what has to do with adequate ideas and inadequate ideas 
So there's kind of, you can have a kind of random encounter that brings you some kind of joyful affect. Um, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have an adequate idea of it. So this could be something, I don't know. Uh, okay, I, I have this problem that I've noticed is whenever I try to think of examples, they are quite ridiculous. And they're almost always about uh, either illegal things or very uh, socially um, taboo subjects. For, that's just how my mind works, I guess. So I'm, I'm going to, yeah. I'll, that's ethics I'll for you. <laughs> say what? I said that's ethics for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, uh, my ethics probably fail uh, according to most people's uh, criteria. But um, yeah, so you've got these adequate ideas, got inadequate ideas, or I have this random encounter with something, it leads to joy, but I don't have an adequate conception of it. I don't know exactly how it is that these relations compose each other and agree with each other, or agree with each other so that they can compose themselves into this common notion of this greater body of joy and whatnot. Um, and instead, so a lot of the things he seems to be talking about, uh, including as a kind of self-discipline kind of thing, is, and this would be the role of reason also. So the I think, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion in this section was about kind of uh, how time and the affects kind of how the how their intensity and their strength depend on these different kind of combinations of is it present is it past is it is the image presenting itself as some future well that's not you know as strong as a present affection but uh it's stronger than a past one that seems to have already you know been in the past that's uh so, and then he's got the whole like uh, possible. So necessary is the strongest, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. And then possible and contingent and all these things. So I think what he's doing with that is presenting something where, so it seems to me it's the principle basically of a kind of, uh, in some cases, it's it's a good idea to defer immediate enjoyment of something for some kind of more stable long-term kind of uh i guess joy you could call it i don't know uh, so i don't know just something like try try not to give a ridiculous example okay just whatever chocolate cake you know that's a good example i i hear people use that all the time uh i don't even really like chocolate cake that much so it's kind of like whatever but okay so you love chocolate cake, but and it when you eat it, indeed it tastes tastes great. You get some kind of you know joyful passion out of it, but eventually that if you eat too much, too frequently, blah blah, blah that will break down uh, the constituent relation of your body, and uh, yeah, you'll die um so that's that seems to be kind of what he's talking about uh reason would be like hey uh that's this is immediately is some kind of stronger affection in the moment to want to eat this cake but if i can restrain that enough to see that you know the better thing to do is to i don't know not eat just tons of chocolate cake all the time or whatever that's basically what he's talking about so that's, I, wouldn't yeah. he also because i'm trying to plug into this example reason wouldn't couldn't just give you the truth chocolate cake's going to kill you but it has yeah, to present, yeah it has yeah, to exactly. present something with a stronger affect yeah yeah definitely so i think that's uh so in the in the discord thing my example was meth addiction. 
but it's kind of I think that's although I think that's very relevant is at a pretty striking vivid example where people can easily understand you know uh meth is bad for you chocolate cake is bad for you uh and uh so yeah because of that uh but because okay well because you understand that it's bad for you that does not mean that you still won't eat the chocolate cake and that you still won't uh smoke the meth or whatever <coughs> um so wh what do you have to do you have to have some kind of affect that is stronger and that's what uh reason is so we we can't do th all of this ourselves that's why he he's very much kind of a pro-human society kind of thing in organizing uh our encounters so that we because we're the most likely thing to agree with each other so we're the most likely thing to help compose these joyful encounters with bodies and whatnot so in this case it would be something like okay maybe i have to go to rehab or somebody i don't know my mom takes my meth away oh no like god damn it mom <laughs> um you know that's gonna in the immediacy of that that's that's a sadness you know because it's taking away my power of acting uh my joy in my smoking my meth but uh overall that can help kind of compose those encounters so that they lead towards something that is overall really uh increasing my power of acting that's keeping my striving uh striving so, so did, yeah. did you say reason in that in that example that reason is an affect oh so i think reason i think you can have affects that are in accord with reason i don't know if he'd want to say that reason is an affect in the in a strong sense of that I think you would talk more about, he talks about agreement with reason. Well, in, the, in that case, it really does sound just like Plato or very much like Plato, because, you know, Plato would say that reason is your, that one of the, one of the fe features that, or one of the, the, fe the abilities that reason has is to know the good. So like reason is capable of knowing what the good is, but it's only, um, motive is this passion for the truth you know goodness truth and beauty but it, it's capable of knowing the good the appetites don't know anything they're uh, literally don't know anything they just want and they just want fulfillment so the appetites are just about satisfaction seeking pleasure and and since reason has no inherent affective component that can that can engage with those it has to employ these sort of affective spirited components in order to outweigh or counterbalance the 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 you know the appetites so i mean you know like socrates literally says like the the warriors are in league with the rulers in disciplining the plebes um the spirit has to be has to be in league with reason in order to discipline the appetites. So, I mean, I, I don't know why I'm pushing this, but except that I, it, it, do, it does sound very similar to me. Yeah, I, th I think that is pretty similar. Um, the only thing I would say that the most striking difference, I think, is probably that it's not so much reason um, you know, something completely opposed to appetites, especially in general, but it's more a way of kind of, uh, you know, it's also, it's almost like this kind of ideal uh, that would orient desires or appetites in a certain way. It not necessarily suppress all of them because, you know, you can have a, a desire that is in accord with reason. Well, so, I mean, Plato, Plato would agree with that too, because 
you know what the whole thing about like he doesn't say that the appetites are in opposition to reason he just says they just want what they want and and so then the the life of virtue is rationalizing the appetites but what what rationalizing them means is is practicing virtue so that your appetites become moderate right that whole doctrine of the mean thing that he and aristotle are into and so what what happens is in the the person who's acquired virtue and justice they've spent you know reason is capable of recognizing what's the appropriate amount of food what's the appropriate amount of anger what's the appropriate amount of this and that you know, you can't extinguish the appetites because if you did that, you would just die. Literally, you you need the appetites because the appetites are what keep you alive. But that through the through this process of habit formation, you tune up the soul. I mean, you know, he has literally has these musical metaphors, right? You tune up the soul so that your appetites are all moderate and appropriate. So as Aristotle says, you want the right amount at the right time for the right reasons, blah, 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 blah. And so again, in that case, then in, in the fully disciplined soul, the appetites have become aligned with reason and that you want what really is good for you. You know, so reason sets that sets that goal. And then through that process of self-discipline and habituation, eventually you want the good. And, and so, again, they're not they're not really an opposition. It's just that they they're they're unreg they're initially unregulated and poorly disciplined that sounds similar to i guess what i'm getting from spinoza i put it in the chat but to me like the model right like reason can help get our appetites back in accordance with like the human body as opposed to in the case of an addict, you know, it's like their appetites are no longer serving their body. They've been detached from their model and they're affected by different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I think that is, yeah, that is, I mean, it's, it is very similar. I think he's definitely got a lot of those components going on. Uh, although I still, I think there is still this, uh, like Plato, I mean, um, I think Spinoza will, he gets more of a kind of uh, mystical in the, the fifth part where he's going to have a, so we'll see uh, what's going on there. But I think there's something where Plato wants to do something that's kind of like transcendent of the body, where I think Spinoza wants to work kind of within the body. although. Uh, no, but like you're saying, uh, it's definitely a case where Plato wants to say, okay, yeah, you have to start with the body, even, you know, kind of in the symposium, you start with first, like the, you know, the, the physical beauty of the, the body of the lover, you start at this, and then kind of have this ascension up to eventually, you know, the idea of the good and whatnot. Um, but I think for Spinoza, there's something um, where that's never kind of like, you don't ever like fully kind of leave the uh, the land of encounters and bodies and whatnot, where I think the kind of the ultimate, um, this tendency in Plato, you can see in, in the uh, Phaedo, Phaedo, yeah, uh, the one where he's, it's uh, Plato or Socrates, is drinking the hemlock finally and um he's like oh i gotta tell you all about how death is is awesome so uh the body is what is against philosophy and you know truly understanding truth and whatnot and when you're free of the body you'll you know get to have this vision of all this cool stuff you'll get to learn all this all the these truths and ideas and it'll be fun i promise but only if you do philosophy and you know had this kind of ascetic kind of practice um so there i think the big difference with that and some that spinoza would want to say is that 
Well, I think the thing is that uh, Plato, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that Christian concepts are so close to Plato, is um, St. Augustine and whatnot. Um, but uh, what is interesting there is that Plato kind of sets it up where the you have some kind of like a reward almost like a telos a goal kind of and that when you die if you've done it right then you'll have you know the truth and whatnot although it definitely requires this kind of practice you know during your life to kind of es escape from you know the passions of the body and whatnot that but he sees he sees those passions of the body as something that really just it's only kind of purpose is to um confuse our ideas and whatnot where i i think um spinoza has an idea where you can have bodies indeed uh be composed of each other and still have this um uh, a truth out of that too where i think uh plato would want to say no just if you can you just have to calm those things down just enough so you can perceive these ideas and these ideas naturally lead towards this kind of disembodied soul and that's the real faculty that knows truth so yeah yeah you I mean, know do I, you think, does that I, sound I think like you're... a I think you're I think you're right in in pointing that out. I think you know I think play, I'm here I'm I'm not I don't have text to support this, but my sense is, you know, you're we're, we're sort of these these uh, rational souls that are unfortunately attached to a physical body, and that the 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 reason you 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 need to discipline your appetites, not for Plato I think not only just just because it's virtue, but because that's the only way to kind of get your body uh, to quit. You know, quit yelling at you all the time, because really, what you want to do is you want to be able to contemplate the forms and you know to live in this world of pure intellection, and so that the the whole you know the, a big reason why you're disciplining the body is so that you know it can quit quit interfering with what you would really rather be doing, which is living in this pure world of transcendent forms and so on. So yeah, I think I think you're right to point that out. It seems like Spinoza has a much more uh integrated sense of the two and and much more um appreciation of physicality in the body than than plato does i th i think you're i think you're right about that yeah it's the other thing that i kind of realized when you're in that description of um plato's theory is so you have so plato he makes a pretty big distinction out of the appetites of the body desires on one hand and then the the spirited aspects of the soul on the other where i think what spinoza wants to do is say that those two are completely tied together that they're the same thing really that your your desire is like this striving like a spirited kind of you know impetus uh endeavor i think that's the whole idea of the kind of the kanatis it's it's desire you know it's just striving that's also this kind of spiritedness that's like leading towards something um so i think yeah i don't know that'd be an interesting to i could definitely see somebody writing a paper on that or something it was it's interesting but um yeah You didn't write a paper on it and use my example of smoking meth. You're a professor of will appreciate that. Hey, I'd be okay with that if you want to write it. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think of, I'll just, why not? Okay. Yeah, I was, I was trying to think of examples, just kind of like write before like a few hours ago or so and um i was thinking like oh yeah um 
if you're you can either choose you know like the immediacy of having sex and getting an std or not and i was like what that's why am i choosing these examples like why <sighs> yeah i don't know i don't know um my the my thesis advisor, uh, who I also TA'd for a couple of times, he he would give these horrific, awful examples, and he did it because he 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 said it would it would uh, scar the students for life, and and they would always remember the examples. So that so I do that too. I I tell these terrible terrible examples to sort of s scar the souls of. The students so they will never forget this lesson i actually uh had a young woman start uh start crying a little bit because of one of my examples i'm like oops so, <laughs> I, I did feel bad about that okay now i'm curious do you remember what your example was that made this, yes uh, i yeah. i have this example that i used to compare uh kant and mill and I won't give the details, but the example involves um, a young mother holding a an infant in one arm and a toddler in the other with her with her hand, and the toddler falling into the water and drowning. <laughs> and so, I, I uh, in a, in one in one example the child survives, and in, a, in the other example the child does not survive. And there was this young woman on the front row one semester, and this tear started trickling down her face. It turns out she was a young mother. And I was like, oops, my bad. I, don't, I always love good uh, dead baby jokes, so. Oh, I'm going to get canceled. <laughs> Sorry to, to drag everybody off on Plato for all that time, but. That's okay. I found the distinction really helpful. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, okay, this is not related to Spinoza exactly. I mean, I could maybe, but is there some, did Zoom have some kind of update? Why can't I get the chat to be going at the same time as the view? The, uh, is anybody else experiencing this problem? Usually I can have the view, all these windows, I can see all these cool people, and I can see the chat over on the side, and it's just like re absolutely refusing to do this now. And it's giving me very sad affects. Um, yeah. Just me, great. that yeah okay well <clears throat> while we're here i've been kind of typing about this in the chat but something that really surprised me after uh all of the time that we put into getting to this part uh not that all of that wasn't great too of the ethics the actual ethics of the ethics was how um uh to put it one way uh unconventional uh this theory is as an ethical theory because I've put, I've been thinking a lot about what Spinoza wrote. And it's uh, the only thing I can take away from this is that it is a kind of moral subjectivism with caveats, right? And that, that so like good and evil are essentially defined in, in the, in solely in the context of the actor, right? And, and in every situation that seems to hold that good and evil are defined in the context of the actor. There is no like general evil or set of moral laws of good and evil necessarily. But what there is, is whether or not you have adequate knowledge to, uh, to certainly know uh, whatever will be useful to you. Right. And there's all sorts of situations that came up in my head that are just completely contrary to how we think about ethics today. So one of them that I was toying with was like factory farming. Right. And uh, plenty of people, whether you think factory farming is fine or evil, whatever it is, um, to put yourself in the situation of like, how would Spinoza um, evaluate the actions of somebody who was, let's say you wanted to be a person who 
took down factory farming. So you targeted a farm like some of these activists do, and they, they either uh, destroy cages or they damage the facility or any of these other ideas or block roads or whatever. The only way that you can evaluate that, it seems to be the case, is what on whether or not I was doing so with adequate knowledge of the, the system that I'm engaging with, which in this case is factory farming, and whether or not that action brought me joy. And that's a very interesting place to be in because it isn't appealing to any of like any grand idea of, oh, well, are animals being harmed? I don't see where that would tie into Spinoza's calculation anywhere. It doesn't come into, oh, well, I could, you know, let's say this was like a global thing. We need factory farming to, you know, feed people or whatever. It doesn't care about any of that. I'm not seeing anywhere where it's like, we must care about the good of the many being fed. It's all based on your attitude towards the action and whether or not you had adequate knowledge of the action that you're performing. Am I missing something? Or is that pretty good? Yes. First thing that comes to my mind is, is the joy piece is, is tied to, I guess, perfection of the human body, which I think Spinoza makes the argument that we naturally, in being in agreement with other human bodies, it's in our best interest to, to make decisions that would support other human bodies. So I, I guess I see it being tied to human bodies, but as far as maybe animals are concerned, maybe not so much, but I think, you know, you might make the argument that long, long-term consequences of harming the environment might come around to affect humans. And so again, it's in our interest to preserve animal species and the environment. I guess, and I guess maybe this is my misunderstanding. So I guess when you said joy, I, I was tying joy to his specific definition of joy, which to me isn't just like, I had fun, so fuck it, but more so just how it feeds into like my relationship with other humans. Um, so I guess I, I see that, but then I was also the adequate knowledge piece. Is knowledge even necessary? Like, I think the adequate knowledge piece might help us, um, I guess, like find joy in it. But I think we might still do something without adequate knowledge, but it might increase our power or it might make us joyful. On the adequate knowledge part, I just think Spinoza would say that you can't know the effects of your actions without adequate knowledge of the system that you're engaging with, whatever it is. So like I could, like I could go in half cocked to a, uh, I don't know, like a bull ring, but if I don't understand what like the rules are of a bull ring or how to ride a bull or something, like I'm not gonna get the expected consequence at the end of that. So in a sense, you're more acting irresponsibly that, so you can't know, you cannot certainly know to be useful to you, whatever that, that good is. which I'm not even going to get into whole like the knowledge skepticism thing. Like how can we like basically act on <laughs> there's, there's a big question here on that as well. But um, I think like the, the problem that comes up is, is with the adequate knowledge question in the sense that I don't know if it will consistently and always supply you with like, Oh, I have adequate knowledge of this thing. Therefore, if you disagree with me or my action, you just didn't have proper adequate knowledge of this thing. I think there's plenty of like moral gray areas we can think of that we appeal to either some kind of intuition or just bona fidely genuine, uh, incomplete information, but we still feel like we have a moral or ethical ability to act in a certain way uh, that wouldn't work in Spinoza's situation that would have kind of like damning consequences right? <laughs> or potentially damning consequences. Um, another common one is like the, the reverse mugging hypothetical that you guys might have heard before, where it's like you see this big, burly, strong guy and a much smaller, meeker guy, and the big, burly, strong guy is beating up the weak guy, and you come over to help, and you beat up the big, strong guy. Well, it turns out the small, meek guy was actually the one trying to mug the big, strong, burly guy, but you just assumed with inadequate knowledge that you were going to be helping somebody. I think that's the kind of thing that Spinoza is erring on is that you can't know what, what the good is, what is actually going to bring you joy without adequate knowledge of a given situation. 
so the good and the bad would be they don't he doesn't have a general concept of that so it would be um situation dependent where you would have um so certain encounters will create uh objectively based on the encounter uh a relation of good and bad based off of that so i can say that something is you know good or bad according to this encounter for this mode so uh but that's not necessarily a, a subjective thing in the same for the same reason that um you know uh even though it has to do with you know affects or you know feelings or whatnot it's still uh objective in the sense that indeed it's it's happening um it's kind of objectively objectively uh, right right yeah objective, i mean you know? <laughs> i'm not i'm not gonna say that like no none of this is happening as spinoza lays it out i think i'm, I'm using the terms like when I say sub moral subjectivism, I'm using it to be specific. Like there, it's an anti-moral realist philosophy. Like we're not going to like hold up the magnifying glass and find the good because that would, that would imply a bunch of universal moral statements, most likely that Spinoza would never get behind. It's all context dependent in the same way, like maybe a utilitarian calculation would be context dependent, right? Um, it's very difficult to construct entire like, constant uh, universal moral laws for a utilitarian view in the same way it would be for this because of how good and evil are oriented towards useful to us um and that to me when you combine that with the problem of adequate knowledge places us in a really weird situation to where we with inadequate knowledge may see someone as being acting in a completely evil manner. You know, I, there's some people who would think uh, <laughs> like, um, what's a great example? Everybody's talking about the banks, right? I'm sure there's people out there who believe that like the Fed is acting in a completely evil manner with their recent actions, but have very inadequate knowledge of the, uh, of the banking system, right? But you're Relying on the fact, essentially, that you can come in and say, like, hey, you don't have complete and total knowledge of how the system works, so you should probably shut up, which is fine, maybe. But then we're saying that you have to have complete, adequate knowledge in a system in order to be in a position to even morally challenge somebody. Otherwise, like, why am I talking about, like, the failings of oil drillings, right? Like, oh, they should have done X, Y, Z. I don't. I don't have adequate knowledge of drilling oil. Like what position am I in to say that they did a bad job, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, that, is that he, I don't think he's saying that uh, you have, you need adequate knowledge in order to actually do something that is considered good we kind of so you might by happenstance strive to do something good that in the relative sense that he's talking about which i definitely think yeah he's he's a objective uh relativist in a sense but that's what i like about spinoza completely uh but i'm also a basically Nietzschean so what well, it's uh, that it's go. that what we certainly know to be useful to us that just like rings in my head like a gong every time I'm I'm thinking about this um, idea because I mean, maybe maybe what I'm hearing Christian saying is like what how do we go about action when we don't have adequate knowledge and what do we use as a judgment at that point yeah, because naturally, or, I think we're always going to come across incidences where we don't have adequate knowledge, where we don't know, and, and how do I act at that point? Or, or how do we condemn the actions of somebody in a space where we just genuinely don't have adequate knowledge? I don't have fucking adequate knowledge of the factory farming system, right? Like, I don't, 
work in the ins and outs and know all the things that I would need to know for all the other examples of adequate knowledge we've talked about. But so how, that's the perspective I'm coming from. But how is that different from the way things really are? I mean, I, uh, you know, every, every, just, I mean, that seems to be true. Every deci- every judgment I make is basically is based on inadequate knowledge. And so I'm always aware that I could be wrong because I don't have all the facts. And I mean, that just seems to be, at least for me, that seems to be true. You know, like, I mean, it it often happens, like, you know, like you said, with that mugging example, it often happens that I make these, these moral judgments against people, situations, corporations, whatever. And then I I hear more, or like, you know, like, here's, you know, another example, the woman who, you remember the woman who sued McDonald's because she spilled hot coffee, in her lap, and everyone was saying, "Oh, what a ridiculous thing! Wah wah wah! Hot coffee!" And I, I can't remember all the details, but apparently the, the the coffee was like ridiculously hot. I mean, like crazy hot. And and she spilled yeah. in her lap, and she got like second degree burns, and her clothes stuck to her. I mean, it caused real physical damage. Well, the first time I heard that, I was like, "Oh God, really? Come on!" And then I heard the rest of the story. <laughs> so. I mean, that, isn't that just the way it is? I mean, how, how is, I guess I don't see where, where the complaint is. So if, if someone was in, an air, in a position to claim expertise on a topic, like let's say, um, I don't know, let's look at military affairs, right? Um, <laughs> most people have no idea at all what's going on militaristically on a geopolitical level, right? But a lot of us are more than happy to throw moral condemnation at the effects of their actions. Right. But all that they would have to do under this context is say, that's neat, guys, but you don't have adequate knowledge of the military industrial complex and geopolitics and all these things that get us to engage in warfare. So sit down, be quiet or go study military affairs for the next 20 years or whatever. My, my, My response is what adequate knowledge do you have that I don't have that would justify the 2003 invasion of Iraq, for example? Okay, convince me, you know, if you have all of this knowledge of the military industrial complex and the geopolitical situation, such that you think I'm wrong in condemning that invasion, share that knowledge with me. Yeah, but what if they explained it to you as from 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 the people who, hypothetically speaking, ought to be the ones with the most adequate knowledge of their exact occupation? And you just didn't agree or weren't convinced by them. Does that mean that they're adequate? You've you've now shown that they don't have adequate knowledge or do you still not have adequate knowledge? It seems like this is an invaluable problem that we've put ourselves in, unless we're talking about like math uh, and maybe some science. Uh, These social issues, when we're talking in the context of adequate knowledge, seem like they're almost impossible to navigate. I think what he wants to do is so it goes back to this idea of common notions where okay if I encounter a body that our relations agree then there is an affect of joy so that affect of joy is kind of like uh, an index um, by purses theory of signs anyways um it's something kind of pointing to or indicating that there's a direction there to follow although that it doesn't that doesn't give you adequate understanding so what would be adequate in that case would be if i understood what about the essences of my own body and the other body created that agreement in which i could in which i had that affect of joy so it's a very specific idea of adequate knowledge that has to do with a very specific notion of joy or affects. And I think that's what he's saying we would use. So if I if I had, okay, my example, I have this affect of joy, that can be an occasional cause that can indicate there's some kind of agreement there. It can definitely still keep people astray from not knowing what's going on. But I think he wants to build from that level of first saying um, you operate at the most particular 
level and then you can build from there um and that's how you really build these kind of you know collective uh agreements of joy and whatnot in a very embodied kind of concrete physical level where the kind of um making you know like a judgment about a hypothetical based off of some like absolute specialist knowledge of geopolitics i think that is not what he wants to do okay so then let's although, change it slightly because oh, I, th- I like oh, the direction okay. you're okay okay so though i think you can have a kind of spinozist um at least based off a hypothetical you could give a kind of a spinozist interpretation of something like you know the war in iraq based off the idea of well hypothetically you know we understand that well it's not really hypothetical but yeah there's people dying that's pretty that's usually pretty bad for spinoza um and uh yeah going from there you know it's kind of follows that i would say spinoza would be against something that that war is generally probably not a good um collection of bodies and affects together that that seems to be like a decomposition you know so i think you can have some kind of a evaluation like my my particular one wasn't very good but you can still uh use a kind of spinozist evaluation of things like that and, and what should i wouldn't what this ends I, up I don't think spinoza is like giving anybody uh like specialist tips for like how to do geopolitics exactly that's that's not what i was saying i don't think he is saying that i think he's saying well okay coming back to your example what you were doing is you were building up a system that ultimately like oh hey we have these like joy affectations in relation to one another and you're building up a relativist system off of that right so like let's just go to the golden relativist talking point female genital mutilation right ugly stuff that we really typically don't like in the West, right? But a bunch of people with joyous affects in another part of the world got together and said, boy, we really seem to be clicking on something here. I guess we're going to start doing this or keep doing this, right? Spinoza's, so this is not unique to Spinoza now, but it opens itself up to the same issue that like we all live under this same unified world, with the same unified laws and circumstances, but we've reduced our talkings of, of, moral considerations to those of our neighbors essentially where it's like i well who am i to criticize them and the the affects of joy that they've felt with their other members of their nation that allow them to continue on with this practice right i mean i don't know very many people who agree with that personally i'm not saying that that's a refutation of spinoza but it could be a potential issue i think reason could operate pretty soundly to figure out that female genital manipul- mutilation, whatever, uh, that, that is uh, a generally a bad encounter. And so just because there are affects of joy, that definitely doesn't mean that it is good on uh, some kind of larger generic level. So that, that which is useful to us must be that which is joyful and reasonable or, or rational rather. Well, I got the, you know, I can't actually, maybe I've been reading ahead a little bit because I'm going to have to grade again, but so maybe I'm thinking of something that's ahead, but he, he seems to say that, you know, I can't maximize. So, he, you know, I I need to, or what would be good is for me to max, is me to maximize, is to f- fulfill my nature as much as possible, which means maximize the act, act uh, the activity of my power. You know, virtue is my power. And, but that I can't do that in a community where everybody else is also not doing that. And so that in order for me to, to fully express my nature, the most effective way of doing that is to live in a community of people where everyone is able to do that. And then that creates certain political inhibitions. 
you know, it, it, it limits, it limits the, the, it limits my ability to express my power in indefinite ways, because that's, you know, it's, so it's, it's kind of an, an argument from enlightened self interest, but nevertheless, it seems like it does uh, put some limitations on, you know, like maybe if it per personally gives me great joy because i you know, because I've got some weird external affects from our external forces from the community that are inducing me to think that this activity will, you know, will feel good, but nevertheless, that activity is going to impinge on the ability of other people to express their power. It creates a kind of self-limiting context, you know, seems to me, at least it seems to be, he's saying something like that. It very well could be the case, you know, um, why couldn't that limitation extend to, well, we have to, <laughs> we can't have the, like, even just directly to Spinoza, he was, he was Jewish, right? Like, I mean, I'm probably was circumcised, probably was pretty cool with circumcision. Uh, it's really not a hop, skip and a jump away from these two things. Right. Um, I don't, I don't see that he would have been having some massive writing about that either, because he probably would have used that same kind of argument in a different context where he would have said like, well, Hey, we live in this society and we have these norms and we have to kind of impinge on each other's well, otherwise freedom sometimes because this is what we do right we, this is how we maximize our own power um it seems like that could just lead to another moral slippery slope but again you know this only stands if i'm i from the outside i'm saying well i don't like that spinoza and he would say well sorry you don't agree with us yes i think those all the, these examples, they seem to be their joyful passions, but there's still all these passive affects, and those don't operate off of adequate ideas. And he's going to say that, you know, um, if there's all kinds, you know, joys and destruction and mutilation and whatnot, but you only get those because of some kind of a previous sadness that puts these kind of traces in your body or uh you know external causes from your society to give you these you know inadequate ideas about how bodies agree with each other and whatnot so you can still get some kind of joy from that but that would not lead you to you know kind of fully embrace then what uh that that joy means therefore like keep going with it yeah, I'll, I'll try one more time between a kind of like passive joy and then an active one where that's going to be from yeah completely uh understanding the adequate idea which would be understanding exactly in what way those bodies agree with each other so they give joy or also how they would disagree with each other where they'd give each other uh, a sadness or a decrease in power and so I think from that, you could, it's not probably a huge leap to say that you could give an analysis like that of something like, uh, I don't know, genital mutilation and uh, say that, yeah, it's uh, generally not a good thing. I'll just ask one question and then give up the floor. You said something that I thought was very interesting. And you were talking about the, I, I don't want to like misquote you. You said the inadequate knowledge of the relations of bodies. Is that how you put it? Relation to other bodies that brings you joy, right? How would you, uh, if someone, if you were to bring that charge to somebody and say like, hey, the reason you're doing this is because you have inadequate knowledge of how the relation to other bodies brings you the affect of joy. And they said, no, I don't. I have total knowledge of it. I can explain to you exactly how this relation to other bodies brings me joy. And you just reach this like impasse. What do you, what do you do at that point? Like <laughs> all they would have to do is say and, and demonstrate in their own capacity that they have their own understanding of knowledge for that, that particular interaction. Right. Unless you're going to say that you fully understand the, how they relate to other people in the affect of joy better than they do themselves. I think it would be something like 
uh, in Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you know that that huge fight gets like built up, and then uh, instead he just shoots him, and it's like, oh my god, yeah, I think it would be something like that because I, if okay, if you really have uh, an adequate knowledge of these things, you just like take, you know, Spinoza's word and whatnot, then I think you would not be able to be convinced yourself um although you may not convince the other person but yeah just just shoot them that's that's my answer yeah yeah i mean that that's that's what i that that right there is the conclusion that i basically thought this whole time is that there isn't like a real moral mediation going on here what we've done is effectively like just reduced ourselves back to the state of nature just on just the only separating line is who we have like direct uh, relations with the affect of joy to those are the only people that we can engage in this like deeper moral introspection with right otherwise like just shoot them i don't know I, that that I to mean, me that sounds like a pretty damning me. moral conclusion well, you just said it though like what do you mean i haven't convinced you you just shoot them <laughs> i'm sorry i'm not i i'm high energy here i don't mean to sound like i'm overbearing but like didn't isn't that literally what you just said Wait, what did I just say? You said it would be like the Indiana Jones scene. Like if you both believed that you had uh, adequate knowledge of what was going on here, you just Indiana Jones them. You just shoot them. Uh, oh, you took. OK, that was a that was just a joke. That was oh, I'm well, not serious. I'm sorry. I mean, I thought that that's why not. Uh, it was a joke. I don't know. OK. Well, I'm sorry. I thought you were being serious about that response. Somewhere along well, the line. I mean, uh, go ahead. No, you got it, Aiden. All right. Uh, somewhere along the lines, I think Spinoza said that, like, if so, something like if somebody didn't have an affect or didn't they didn't produce an affect that affected you, then you were kind of neutral to, um, like, you didn't have, like, an affect of joy or um what was the other one sadness or happiness or sadness or anything like that so um i mean you were saying like christian like if they didn't have an affect of joy like everybody else just whatever it's you know like we we're only interested in those who produce the affect of joy but if there's like this kind of neutral ground it seems like there's potential for joy and why wouldn't we want to increase joy in um, other people that are like us if we potentially could, right? I don't, I like, I, I don't see how the argument leads just straight to like, you know, if it's it's the increasing of those that already have affected us in a joyful way, um, and we want to increase the power of those that have done that because they're like us, and like, you know, potentially, you know. Um, no, that's that's really. I just want to kind of to bring that to the the neutral grounds of of somebody who hasn't really affected you yet. Yeah, I guess, I guess the the problem isn't between me and them, right? In in these kinds of situations, it's how they're treating other people that they have those relations to. So my our neutral interaction um, could be joyous in in all other contexts, but then they go home and they do something I don't like. Right. That's in the situation of like female genital mutilation is like, but we have these two distinct cultures that have, you know, like using the relativist talking point that developed their own cultural norms for whatever particular sets of reasons uh, why they developed in ways to where they are morally incompatible to the extent that they can't even like properly judge each other's actions anymore. And that to me is, is a problem. Um, because it leads to situations where I, I know Chase was joking, but I think he's right, where it's like, well, we have no way of like bridging these moral gaps. So we'll just like beat each other over the head with clubs, I guess, if I can't convince you otherwise. Um, yeah, it's, and you know, maybe I'm off on the reading, but this is something I've been wanting to talk about for a while, uh, basically <laughs> for like three or four sessions now. And I'm glad we're finally here to talk about it. But uh, I, I think that having this, this requirement that the good be that which is 
certainly useful to us, certainly no to be useful to us is one that carries with it a lot of implications when you bring in his ideas of adequate knowledge and the relations to other individuals and the affects of joy that um, make for a very unconventional moral philosophy, at least in, in modern terms, <laughs> with stark implications, in my opinion. I don't know if that totally answered your question, but or your point, whatever. Yeah. I'm trying to find the passage where he says that, you know, what's useful to your own advantage, you know, reason has it where that advantage would be for all, all humans. So it wouldn't be just to you as a kind of conventional individual. He seems to want to say that what is, you know, uh, good or advantageous useful for you is also what would be good and advantageous for all people and i think you could even you know so i don't think spinoza exactly says this but why not extend it to all bodies and say yeah i think that's the the idea of the common notions is something like that where you're trying to think of you know how can we get all these bodies and all these affects to kind of first work together to bring some kind of mutually beneficial affect. And then this is also this is also the same way that you would explain kind of why people do certain things, <laughs> why people are determined, you know, to think something that is inadequate or whatnot, like that you can just kind of like shoot people and that's good or whatever that which would be, you know, that's not like an actually inadequate thing to do because it's obviously causing, it's not good for, you know, all people to just like spontaneously shoot people. Although that's the, okay. The context though, the movie. So, you know, there's bad guys going on. Let's just take it for, yeah, hypothetically. Okay, good. They're bad guys. And, um, but I can either, you know, fight with them and then possibly what, uh, possibly lose my life or I can just simply shoot them. And then which, which is better. I, I think Spinoza would indeed say that if you could el eliminate something that indeed is the cause of sadness without uh harming yourself that that is indeed that is good for uh all people to follow in a way so it's kind of like a version of the golden rule really which i was actually kind of somewhat slightly surprised by that uh the fact that yeah don't do something that to other people that you don't want to have done to you it's pretty simplistic, but I think that's kind of uh, what he's heading towards there. I mean, I was going to reference that uh, Aiden was reminding me of this, but I think it's towards the end of the kind of little preface, preface to this section where doesn't he say something when he's first talking about kind of good and evil and he says something about like if somebody else has is kind of affected by these external passions in a way that renders them like no longer someone you could agree with, then it might be good for you to like destroy them or decompose or strike them or something. And I guess I hear him almost speaking to the to this exact instance of like what happens when and I think Chase said it earlier, like maybe a certain cultural practice, we might want to interpret it as an external passion that they're affected by and it's inadequate and it's not contributing to me or like the human model that I want to play by. Um, like how justified am I to, to say that to another person? Of like your model of humanity and increased power is wrong. Um, and I guess, I guess it, for me, it does, I guess, point back to that, I guess, the theory of adequation, like his adequate ideas and what is actually 
considered an adequate idea. Um, and, and and I don't know if it's just arguing reasonably. I think he has a very specific idea of what adequate means, similar to something like Descartes' clear and distinct, um, but his own version, which I feel like would be his his maybe answer of saying like, well, you know, like they might think they have an adequate idea, but like, look, let's look at what an adequate idea actually means. I think that goes beyond my understanding, but maybe Spinoza believes that being able to fl flush that out with somebody I don't know if he believes that you can kind of pull people out of inadequate ideas um, or if, I mean, I guess what he, what he says in the passages we read was this idea that truth isn't going to be, have much value for shifting people's behavior, but it needs to be accompanied with some sort of affect that's as strong or stronger than it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I mean, that, I feel like that question I feel like Christian's question stands for me too, of what does it look like to really confront people on a problem where we're just kind of stubbornly butting heads? Um, and at what point would it be justified for me to, yeah, quote unquote, shoot them, to just, you know, see them as not, a, not an agreeable body? Yeah, and just to make sure it's clear, I'm, I'm not trying to like justify moralistic violence against people, but like, you know, to a certain extent, we're, we're either put into positions where like ethical theories are like, yeah, you should stop the person doing the bad thing, or at least you can if you want to. And then others that say, well, they're just going to do that thing. You like, and you just got to live with that. So <laughs> that's specifically why I was focusing on that perspective. But. And I'm tempted to say something, but I think what I what I would say would be more what Nietzsche would say. And I, at this point, I'm not confident it's what Spinoza would say. So, I... well, I'm quite curious about what Nietzsche would say. Then, is I think he would have a quite a bit to say. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious about that. Well, even if you, you and I might disagree, I think you know we 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 seem you and I seem to have some disagreements about Nietzsche, but I or maybe I even shouldn't even say Nietzsche. Maybe so. Here's a I, here's a, a sort of a real a uh, a relativist response um, that if if everything's based on power, then you can't make any absolute moral judgments because they're, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm also thinking about Thrasymachus in the Republic, but there is no absolute answer to what is good and bad. There is only power, but um, that means you can make judgments based on your own, your own subjective preferences or those of your community purely in terms of power so you know you can't you you can't there is no moral basis for saying something for example what hitler is doing is morally wrong and therefore we should stop him because if if there are if there is no absolute moral wrong that those words don't make any sense but what you can say is we in our community don't like what you're doing and we have the power to stop you and so we're going to stop you and so that's, you know, that's one way of thinking about those, you know, you can't that you can't make any absolute moral judgments. And in fact, I think what, you know, I think what Nietzsche would say is that moral judgments are just um, are, are assertions of power by another name. So that when I make a moral judgment and I say what you're doing is wrong, what I really mean is I don't like what you're doing and I want you to stop. That's really what that means. A moral assertion is just saying I don't like it. And I want you to stop. But by making a universal moral uh, assertion, it gives me cover. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm justified in, in, in demanding that everyone else behave the way I want them to behave. So what, you know, what uh, universal moral judgments do is they elevate my personal subjective view into a universal view and give me, you know, philosophical and moral cover for demanding 
that everybody in the world obey my personal preferences. And, you know, and I see him just saying, well, well, let's just get rid of all that moralizing. Let's just get rid of all that, that subterfuge. And let's just say what it really is. I want you to behave the way I want you to behave. And if, if I, and if I have the power to do so, I'm going to assert that. So, you know, again, I can't tell, I can't tell, uh, Hitler, what he's doing is wrong, but I can tell Hitler, I hate what you're doing. We hate what you're doing, and we're going to make you stop. So well, that's, a, you know, that's that's a one way of, uh, and frankly, I'm kind of sympathetic to that. I tend to think that moral judgments really are, you know, cover for, universal moral judgments are cover for demanding that other people do what I really want them to do. Well, but isn't it, I mean, it's, but, but look at your example of Adolf Hitler. I, I, to say, I, to say universal moral judgments is me saying what I want people to do. In your example, though, it's, you're not telling Hitler what to do. You're just saying, stop killing human beings who are Jewish. It's, it's an, it's, it's an, it's a, to stop some, some action, not, not a compulsion to, to do something. And I'm not sure what you're, I don't, I don't get that. Cause what I'm saying is, you know, I can say me and my community don't like what you're doing and we have the power to make you stop. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to make you stop. <sighs> can we, can we respond by saying there are different kinds of like, different kinds of dislike. There's aesthetic, like aesthetic, dislike, moral, like moral dislike, you know, um, we, we don't like what Hitler's doing, not because it's ugly, you know, to our eyes, but we have a moral sense of objection to it without necessarily claiming it's universal. Oh, yeah. So the so Spinoza, he says, you know, that we judge based off our affects and we come up with these universal notions based off that from a kind of perspective so i think that first of that kind of like nietzschean point of view you know it's, it's, that's not exactly what spinoza would say but i think he's right in saying that there is this kind of illegitimate universalization that often happens uh where we're doing it from a very particular point of view but that indeed there's a kind of you know in the same way he's talking about yeah, we can't do this all on our own. We can't, you know, be self uh, persevering all on my own. I need some kind of the organization of a city. I need a community. And the moral ideal indeed is this kind of collective body. Uh, it's not just me and my body in a kind of, you know, libertarian kind of paradise where I have like mines in my front yard or whatnot. Um, and it's like, oh, my my property, whatever. Instead, it it's I think also the this kind of um the way that the Konatis it works by trying to you preserve yourself by trying to have this increase of your power of acting. So with that, um you get this kind of augmentation that goes beyond just kind of it, there's something like expansive about this notion that goes beyond just kind of my own advantage and that's why he talks about it as yeah to your own advantage to it's you know it's basically kind of like a rational what is it called like a uh enlightened self-interest or whatnot where but in this case it's not you know, there's really bad ideas of that, but I think in this case he's saying you, but this would work in a way only if you actually turn it into an efficient cause by actually composing physical relations that correspond with uh, these uh, notions of a kind of enlightened self-interest where it's your self-interest becomes connected with something much bigger than yourself in the limited sense of it 
And I think that's where you get a kind of, that's an extension of the basic. Uh, so he says, you know, individuals, the, the essence of an individual is a relation. And indeed, there, so the relations of these parts and this, you know, a relation of speed and slowness, motion and rest. So I can compose a larger body, a, a larger individual, well, I'd be a part in that. Um, but it would still be a relation too. So I think there's always a kind of, you know, tendency towards a greater expansive kind of community that is corresponding with this notion of um, an increase of the power of acting. Um, and I think that's um, that's pretty significant, especially if you take a yeah, something about power. <laughs> oh, uh, so I think, what was I saying? It's significant if you, in the sense that um, there isn't, okay, we usually would take the idea of a kind of, you could take, um, you know, I mean, it's kind of like what Hunter was doing last time. Or you just take word, you know, like power and then say, Oh no, this is this is bad. Or I can just take something and kind of disconnect it uh, from Spinoza's system and say like useful to the self or whatever, and then say that this is like a you know like a lone gunman kind of you know it's like a cowboy maverick kind of ethics. Uh, where I think that that would just require taking it out of the full context of the fact that he wants us to have this kind of expansive kind of community thing. And that's why he's saying, yeah, the advantage of myself would be identical to the advantage of, of all, which I think is, yeah, I think that is important. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm willing to be, I'm willing to entertain that I might be wrong on, you know, what I say about Nietzsche. I mean, part of what I'm basing it on is his, dis, his, his distaste for egalitarianism and in its various forms. But that may be one, that may be one place where he and Spinoza are different because, you know, like you said, Spinoza seems to want to say um, exactly as you say, you know, in order for me to max, I mean, it reminds me of Sartre's thing. You know, I can't will my personal freedom unless I will the freedom of all. You know, it sounds like he's saying something similar. I can't will the maximization of my own power unless I will the maximization of everyone's power around me. But that's, I think that's something Nietzsche would not say. So I think that at least that's my view. But um, so I do think that there, in spite of the, the similarities with regard to power, I, I think there's, Sounds like there's some fundamental differences in their conclusions. Well, the way you just said it, Nevit, about it, it sounded uh, like it was a, a, a reciprocal statement. If I'm going to want power, then I have to let other people have power. Not that I, I, I will let, but I have to accept other people have power. Is that close enough? I think that's what I get the impression that's what Spinoza would say. Okay. Well, Is that right, Chase? If I if I'm going to be able to express my power, I need to I need to let other people express yeah. their power or something like that. Well, I think that would be at least yeah. he'd want to work towards that tendency. So, yeah. Whereas I guess is Nietzsche more along the lines of there's nothing guaranteeing that my body would agree with another person's body and so better look out for my own power where Spinoza seems to have this assumption of like you know man shares something and can come into agreement with other other mankind bodies and so if we're if we're not coming into content if we're not coming into agreement with other men's bodies like they're just lacking something they've been subject to many passions subject to too many passions so I guess Nietzsche's Nietzsche's more so like who knows? You know, I'm, I'm not here to like save other people. I'm not here to convince, help other people become powerful. Um, you know, you, 
I mean, on my, on my reading, Nietzsche has particular values himself, and I don't think he would ever claim that they're universal, but he he has certain values. He, I mean, actually, I guess it's relevant to this Spinoza discussion in the sense of, you know, what constitutes the, um, the, the I don't know, I forgot what the word is, but the image of humanity that you want to instantiate in the world. And I'm not sure this, that, I guess that's one thing I may be where Spinoza and, and Nietzsche disagree on, on what, you know, what is it this, what is it this um, exemplar that we want to see instantiated? And I think, you know, Nietzsche's exemplar does not require egalitarianism. And in fact, egalitarianism may actually uh, impede the establishment of what he sees as the ideal human expression. Um, but I think, you know, so that again, I think maybe that's what maybe that's one way to kind of encapsulate the, the difference here. You know, that, you know, Nietzsche wants to see a certain kind of expression of power. But the other thing that I constantly have to remind myself of is, you know, Nietzsche's, and there's actually a guy in his dissertation that did actually compiled this list of everybody Nietzsche talked about and how favorable and unfavorable his comments were. And, the, you know, in the actually there's an appendix in his dissertation, which just lists all of these people. And his favorite people were artists, even though he says really great things about you know, people like Napoleon and and people like that. His, his the people he said the most favorable things were artists, and specifically, probably his two favorite people were Goethe and Beethoven. So, uh, in terms of in terms of deploying one's power, it you know there are people that say that Nietzsche had has a political philosophy. I'm 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 not sure. I'm kind of skeptical. Other than he doesn't like egalitarianism, and he he likes sort of classical aristocracy in the classical sense of rule by the best, which, you know, for Nietzsche is a certain kind of person. But I think you could argue that that mostly he's concerned with um, exerting power on oneself, on self-creation and so on. So that I always have to moderate my rants about Nietzsche and power with that. Yeah, I think he does have some values like that. And yeah, so life affirmation is a pretty, pretty major one. And um, that corresponds to this kind of creativity that I think that is. So I think, um, you know, some of the, the aspects of where you can take um, Nietzsche's idea of power and will to power and whatnot as something that's like oh my god this is you know justifying the holocaust i mean it's always hitler right yeah um that indeed i don't well first of all i mean just on a specific to nietzsche he was extremely against german nationalism and uh one of the at a time when uh, that was a very rare thing to do. Uh, I mean, he moved out of Germany and lived in Switzerland and basically didn't go back to Germany. And then at, towards the end, he, he claimed to be Polish, which is pretty funny. So he was, uh, that's like around the time he went crazy. But, you know, I, li I like that idea. Uh, Nietzsche the pole but um yeah I think that those notions of creativity I think are pretty important in life affirmation and whatnot so he says like okay the problem with morality is that it's ultimately negates life it's something that turns life as this kind of active force which at times you know must be dominating it, it must be violent uh that it turns that force that it's going to do anyways you know against itself and that's so i think that the kind of the classic example in the genealogy of morality you got the bird of prey but there is no the bird of prey it's canatus is to uh carry off the tiny little lambs because they're they're good they're tasty and you don't have birds of prey without you know this act of uh taking uh eating the little lambs and you know um 
yeah, I think um, the connection with Spinoza would be something like, okay, you understand that, that is that is part of some things like self-preservation or whatnot. And indeed, um, so something like a bird of prey would probably does not have a kind of comparative image of things in order to really interpret. So I think he would say that, yeah, that's just, that's nature. Um, it's unfortunate for the lamb. It's bad. It's, you can even say it's evil, you know, relative to the lamb. Of, so of course they want to, you know, denounce the uh, bird of prey as bad and whatnot. And they have good reason to. Um, but then I think on another level, you could say he would still probably want to say like, okay, but you know, if say if lambs had just like a better ability to, I don't know, make a convincing case and also birds of prey could do something, you know, besides, uh, maybe we can give the birds of prey some kind of like a lamb substitute meat. And then birds of prey would be happy of, uh, you know, they'd have still have their tasty meat, but then the lambs, uh, you know, wouldn't get eaten. That seems to be something that's moving in the step towards a kind of, you know, greater overall joy for, you could come to some kind of agreement then between these bodies, birds of prey and lamb, that normally would disagree with each other to a certain extent they would agree for the the bird of prey so yeah i think um that's probably what spinoza would think of something like that i'm guessing um but then at the same time you'd want to say yeah but this isn't birds of prey and lamb that kind of thing uh would not be reason to you know condemn nature as something just like inherently bad or evil in itself but these things are this is the way nature is and there's gonna naturally be yeah lots of bad stuff and uh you know you can we all strive to do uh what is good for us but at the same time yeah that the same way that's what all of nature does um Spinoza would yeah. agree agree with that, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but that's the point. Birds of prey do not wantedly kill all the lambs and let them rot in the sun. They're killing them because they're going to eat them. It's not, right, we right. hate lambs because they're lambs and they are polluting the globe with their lambness. And so we have to eradicate all lambs from the earth because it's polluting all animals with their lambness and yet they're insidious they're not really animals they pretend to be animals and they're trying to corrupt all the different species of animals into being diluting their animalness and so we have to eradicate them as a bizarre way of protecting not only the birds of prey but other similar animals to us yeah yeah exactly that's uh a good example of a kind of inadequate idea justifying something like that where so the kind of appeal to utility he has i think you can it seems like you can make those kind of understandings where yeah it's in like the holocaust you know or notions of you know racism and what those are seem inadequate that they don't they're not actually useful and pertaining to you know, the actual nature of bodies and how affects work and whatnot, um, where, yeah, something, but there's going to be, yeah, the necessity of nature, you know, means there's going to be bad encounters, but none of those mean exactly all these kind of ridiculous contingent notions that people have of justifying their particular encounter that usually is good for them but bad for someone else um see so yeah, i guess i don't i think you can do uh you can have some decent i don't know kind of evaluations of things with spinoza with his ethics um but yeah there's no kind of like certainty to them or 
whatnot, but I I like that personally. I was I I think if something was giving you some kind of like a certain grounds for you know giving some kind of like a universal kind of thing, I would I just don't really uh like that. And probably I, I think you know uh Nivet, you're kind of you're saying that Nietzsche is like, yeah, okay, there's an aspect of morality which is itself a will to power. So if I could come here and just and say like absolutely this is you're you're bad whatever you're doing you support this and that that itself is also an expression of this uh power that he's talking about so I yeah I think that's definitely right and that you know that's a problem definitely with a lot of uh you know morality but I think um, one thing where Spinoza could possibly kind of be distinct from that is that he would see something like that, you know, that uh, if I do some kind of, you know, moral kind of, uh, you know, uh, virtue signaling, you know, as they say these days, um, if I do something like that, that would not be necessarily some kind of uh, ethically good thing for Spinoza you know does that really contribute to ethics uh, and joy and whatnot I don't know just go on Twitter and find out uh, I think you'll see the answer is definitely not <laughs> um, so I think you know uh, Deleuze he, he makes pretty big um, distinction of this kind of ethics as Spinoza presents versus a kind of morality and usually is tied to this idea of a kind of um, something kind of imminent and situational versus something that's kind of generic and universal, a kind of ideal that's kind of exterior to the situation. Where he's going to say that ethics as something imminent, it's something like a, a, like a facilitative rule that you actually apply instead of something that you kind of uh, look down upon from like the hypothetical situation and say like yeah you can say this about this hypothetical situation this one and whatnot according to some kind of rule that's exterior to that situation so that'd be something like um well i mean even something like the uh platonic like good would be something like that and then uh you make the claim that okay well where is this good coming from for plato you know all of these ideas um they're going to be taken you know from already established states of things that you know maybe that benefits plato to have this be considered the good but i don't know is it for the uh the common good? I don't know. Oh. This seminar is just like exhausting now. Well, you sad affects. You said you'd, you know, after Deleuze, you didn't want to be the explainer, and somehow you ended up being the explainer again. <laughs> so I actually really I, I've actually enjoyed this uh just kind of like reading Spinoza on this very like close level or relatively close um and whatnot but then uh yeah just like to feel I don't know just kind of like I have to explain this and I'm being like attacked by all these things and it's just like so it's all dramatic like I just oh god it's just like Ugh. Look, I I don't mean. Th listen, I I wasn't trying to attack you earlier. If that's the way that you felt, I'm trying to attack yeah, Spinoza. No, no, you just no. happen to be the one coming to bat for him, all right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, but uh, yeah. I mean, I felt certain kinds of ways. It, Spinoza's writings gave me many affects when I read them. So maybe I was projecting too many of those onto you as the mouthpiece. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's part of the game you know I'm, I'm the mouthpiece of spinoza you know i don't uh i don't know 
yeah don't so don't ever um quote me anything that's like spinoza said this i would take it uh rather straight from the horse's mouth uh but yeah and um, yeah this is there was the same thing with uh we read anti-oedipus except honestly i think i'm i'm more kind of like personally tied to i i feel like it's more like personal for like duels and guitars i really i don't i don't even like actually like identify as like a Deleuzian, although if pe people say that about me and I, I don't correct them or anything. Um, but Spinoza, I, I just want people to like appreciate him. And but I'm not a Spinozist. And I, do, I actually I, I disagree with quite a bit. Although I think people tend to of uh, people tend to misunderstand a lot of his ideas, in my opinion. And that's why I feel like I need to, I don't know, this, I think this is kind of somewhat irrational on my part, but I just, I feel like I have to like defend him. It's like, who's going to defend Spinoza, if not me? I don't, I, I don't actually think that, but yeah. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad that you're, uh, or that you, like, well, I said this in Discord, I'm glad that you, you sort of, I don't know, you know, you persistently suggested Spinoza because uh, this is again one of those books that I have needed to read for a very long time, and I think Spinoza's had you know he had such an influence on um, a number of people afterwards. So I think it's important to to understand Spinoza. But, you know whether you agree with him or not, I think it's I think he's definitely worth and pro I, I, at least in some quarters neglected. I you know when I. Uh, Years ago, I never heard much about Spinoza, but I, I hear more now. So maybe pe more people are reading Spinoza. I don't know. But he, he's definitely important, important enough to spend the time with. Yeah, I think I think quite a few people have. Uh, I'm not sure if it's maybe it's increasing. I, I'm not sure. At least in uh, my uh, my quarters, uh, there's certainly quite a bit of interest in Spinoza. Uh, but the more I've been reading him and looking at all these other texts, uh, so I was reading through Schopenhauer, um, and I just saw there's one page, I think I could name probably 10, 12 things on there. It's like, this is like Spinoza, this is like Spinoza, this is like Spinoza. Um, so yeah, I think there's the influence on all the later thinkers is pretty significant. I think that's actually okay. So I was thinking this that okay, Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche and and Spinoza eventually uh so I was reading somewhat about this connection and Nietzsche kind of came uh late to Spinoza. He said by instinct and was like, Oh, I found a predecessor. This is this is great. So why why did that happen i think why did they just happen like you know oh we're in agreement with quite a few things i, I think that's because spinoza influenced schopenhauer mm -hmm. and Schno schopenhauer even though nietzsche doesn't want to you know necessarily admit it you know later nietzsche or at least like basically anything after a birth of tragedy just about uh wants to be like no i'm the opposite of schopenhauer but the truth is he's really taking a lot still from Schopenhauer. Parts of it are being reversed or inverted, you know, but he's uh, the influence from Schopenhauer is still very, very evident. And yeah, this is where same time, I think that's the fact that, oh, wow, Spinoza, he's so much like me. I think it's because this kind of mm -hmm. unspoken mediator of Schopenhauer. I was, I was going to complicate that picture, Chase. I was going to say for a lot of, um, you know, the German idealists from Fichte to, the, you know, Schelling, Hegel, they were influenced by Spinoza, but very keen to distance themselves from Spinoza at the same true, time. True. And then Nietzsche was very influenced by the German idealists, idealists, but was very keen also to distance himself from the German idealists. So in reacting against the German idealists, in, in some way, it's, he'd fall back into a kind of a Spinoza kind of vein. But even insofar as the German idealists were inadvertently 
influenced by Spinoza and he was inadvertently influenced by the German. There's also a continuity, right? So there's like two lines, you know, one, one uh, a fairly continuous line and then one of like uh, movement and then reaction and, and then winding back in a similar place from where you originally started, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that so that makes me think. Okay, so if you look at what Nietzsche liked about S Spinoza, it sounds almost like a polemical thing against. So he's like, yeah, the denial of free will, awesome. Think about that's that's very much okay. So the German idealists, that was one of the things that they hated about Spinoza. Yeah, they're all about you know freedom and consciousness and all that stuff, and Nietzsche's like, yeah doesn't really put a whole lot of uh spinoza doesn't think that highly of you know consciousness and freedom and whatnot and that's great uh so yeah that's that's definitely a good point uh to, just a fine quibble though uh for the german idealist it wasn't consciousness so much as self-consciousness freedom is related is intimately bound up with self-consciousness even worse yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and yet, you know, another thing I think that's useful for about Spinoza and, and a lot of actually a lot of philosophers that people throw rocks at uh, is that taking certain ideas and running them out to the end is very useful, with, whether you end up agreeing with it or not. So, you know, taking like this, like this, this thoroughly consistent pantheism, you know, who else has done that or um you know, this sort of thorough determinism or whatever. But so taking some idea and and running with it to the end and 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 then seeing where you get, you know, whether you end up agreeing with it or not, it's it's a very, very useful project. So yeah, that okay, that is something I've been trying to I can't even I haven't been able to like quite articulate it, except it maybe in so this is something that Deleuze like loves about Spinoza it's really hard to describe exactly what it is but i was trying to you know even i th think if you remember to i think it was maybe like the second week or something i was trying to kind of like get hunter on board and try to describe something like no you just kind of like go with it mm -hmm. as a as a system and you just kind of like you have to evaluate it from like the whole of the system just as like a project, you know. You have to explain and, that to a Hegelian. That you, yeah, you know, I don't 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 criticize a part until you recognize its function within the whole. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so the, okay, so let's say uh, so as more as a joke than anything, I wanted to get I wanted to have like a collection of racist things that Hit, uh, Hitler uh, Hegel said, and then. If Hunter gets rowdy, I would. My idea was I was going to start reading them, but then I actually read. So I, I searched. I think I googled Hegel racist, and there's just like hundreds of academic papers on this. So I kind of I looked through one, and was like, oh my god, this is actually really bad. Like, and then they pointed me to this. Uh, the philosophy of subjective spirit, a section on anthropology on racial variation. So I I read this and uh, basically, first of all, I'm not reading this out loud at anything, and I was just like, oh my god, this this is way worse. Like I never mind. But now I actually have questions for Hunter. Like, what is going on with this? <laughs> or like any Hegelian? I don't because apparently they. Uh, some of them uh, kind of don't really condemn uh, they kind of like make excuses for it at least it seems like to me and so I was talking to some other Hegelians and it's like yeah Todd McGowan who's kind of like this at least like an internet famous Hegelian says like supports the anthropology and stuff like that I'm like so part of it okay he seems to support uh phrenology in it which i thought i thought in phrenology of spirit that was exactly what he was critiquing right he lampooned it in the phenomenology yeah like, um, knowing hegel as well he can do that in one book and then put it up on a pedestal in another book right 
exactly that's what it seems like to me and i that's one thing i do i don't like that about Hagar. there's kind of like this ambiguity of you know you could kind of like retain something and like yeah okay let's let's keep this you know like monarchy or whatnot and uh but then at the same time there's enough of a distance from it where you can always something can always be flipped you know and yeah it's one of the annoying things about hegel as much as i, I really do i think respect him as a philosopher and i even but yeah following that point chase if you really wanted to wind hunter up you could you could say well everything that hegel says right um has this potential of an ironic distance so say something and if people like it good and if they don't like it just claim you were being ironic exactly yeah oh but yeah I so i i really i don't want to uh rile hunter up i, I don't want to do that um <laughs> Especially well, like the, the stuff that was in this book was like way too vile, in my opinion, to it was like it would not have worked for a joke, basically. I was thinking for some reason I was thinking that Hegel, like it was not as bad as it was, but it's it was it's pretty terrible. Although parts of it supposedly were like footnotes that students put or something, but I don't know, maybe, maybe not. It just there seems to be so many authors, not only in philosophy but in literature, that I mean, look at G.K. Chesterton. I mean, a lot of conservatives really flocked to him, but it seems like his anti-Semitism was just as much a part of him as any other part of his ideas and supposedly T.S. Eliot. I mean, hmm. just rampant. And I mean, what do you do? You know, do, I mean, as a pound. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Well, you're oh, yeah, well, he was like a um, straight up fascist, right? Prison. He yeah. made the fascist salute and spent the rest of his life in Italy. He was like, "Yeah, go, go screw, go screw yourself." <laughs> yeah. And don't make I, it, don't get me started on Heidegger. Yeah, my my first semester as a graduate student, I I had a class on Heidegger and and Carnap, and we we spent I don't know like half a class one time talking about why are so many philosophers such assholes and just going through, you know, Rousseau and Heidegger and, you know, you can just start listing all these terrible things these guys did. It's like, I don't know, they're not philosopher kings, that's for sure. Well, I'm always, I mean, what Rousseau wrote, that is it Emile, which was about education, and yet he fathered how many children and sent every single one of them to an orphanage? yeah dude at least keep a couple of them and practice your ideas and then you can you know say hey look i did this you know and then to my sh great chagrin you know the, the 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 godfather of all analytic philosophy bertrand russell seems to have been a really upstanding guy and i'm like <laughs> oh right? what I god know. no don't be a good guy be a terrible person but no he's a great guy Honestly, I had that thought the other day. I forget how, uh, you know, his visage came up on my screen, but I was like, Bertrand, such a pretentious schmuck, but I think I would like you. I think I would like you. Yeah, right. I, I just don't like what you wrote, you know? Right. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. That That's why I think he's like Ronald Reagan. He has like some good quotes, you know, uh, but then it's kind of like when you get into the nitty gritty, I'm like, oh, no, no, this is bad, no. But, okay, so one thing though, at least... So Wittgenstein, uh, didn't he like beat his student or something? There's something, there's some kind of controversy. At least I read this on Wikipedia where he supposedly like beat up his student or, or something. It was like a, I think a young girl too. I, I may be totally misremembering. I, I remember that. hearing something like that. Yeah. Yeah, was, I, yeah. And good old Schopenhauer apparently pushed his landlady down the stairs. and Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can somehow uh, slightly justify that, but it's the landlady, you know, I don't know, capitalism, alienation, I don't know. <laughs> would you feel it's more a little more understandable? Than... Not that, I mean, I think Schopenhauer like would admit himself that he was like an asshole, probably, <laughs> and just probably. be like, I don't, I don't care, you know. Well, but it might be less uh, troublesome if it was a if it had been a landlord. Not a landlord. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's definitely true. I I told uh one of my friends about this, 
and her response is like violence against women is not uh i was thinking about uh there's this thing ranking the how punk philosophers were and there's something i was like uh yeah wittgenstein's high up on that i don't know why Hmm. because he beat up his student (laughs) and the same way i was like yeah schopenhauer like pushed his lane lady down the stairs or something but my friend is not not down at that that's 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 violence against women and that is not punk i don't know i've punk to me is pretty amoral if not immoral it's immoral like gg allen and stuff like that i don't know if y'all are familiar but yeah it's pretty uh punk rock is it's not about morality really so i don't know yeah, and then, you know what, another frustrating one for me is apparently John Stuart Mill was a pretty upstanding guy, and I, I hate utilitarianism. He was a, he was <laughs> yeah. a colonial administrator, though. He did yeah, that's, yeah, the white yeah. man's burden. Okay. Yeah, I so part of Mill is quite strange. So I also am not really a fan of utilitarianism, especially the kind of thing that you can have, like, some, like, objective, like, quantification of of you know pleasure or something i think that is, that's just a ridiculous idea and uh also i don't really like liberalism in the kind of you know especially in the uh kind of like classical liberal actually i don't i just don't like liberalism really but um yeah mill doesn't like that but at the same time you can actually see the difference where he actually said some decent things in his political philosophy about or especially in like utilitarianism like that uh i think he was much better than he's usually presented by the people that he's presented as good by if you look at the details which is kind of gets in the way of the whole like just wanting to i'd rather just be able to dismiss him too but occasionally says some some good things but then yeah the uh the uh he supported colonialism but in a way actually so this is actually it reminded me of what hegel was actually talking about as a kind of these people aren't they have no um spiritual drive to to be rational and historical agents but it it seems like they can uh be kind of uh coerced into you know adopting christianity and adopting reason if we kind of force them to do so you know and it's the same argument that mill i think was making in that he thought that it was like yeah the white man's burden to go and like spread uh liberty and democracy and whatnot which happened to be also colonialism at the same time and you know yeah, white white uh, values and so on. Yeah, white colonial values. Yeah. So that's I mean that's pretty uh major part of intellectual history. It almost seems like it's so many people for for someone to like see past that, you know, even just like I don't know, like a hundred years ago is pretty is a quite an accomplishment um but okay so you know one okay one thing i'll say uh so deleuze he actually seems like he was pretty decent guy nothing like crazy about him there's no uh so the only thing i there's one thing i saw it was on uh reddit where somebody was like presented something that was like oh what a terrible person and i read it and it was something from this uh intellectual biography and it okay so the terrible thing that Dulles did apparently was that he wanted to stop dating this girl so he tried to get his friend who was uh the brother of this girl and tried to like mediate it through someone else this breakup and that's basically it that was the story 
Like that was the extent of apparently that's the worst thing Duels has ever done. Apparently. I don't know. So he, like, he, was, he was French though, so you know. Yeah, so they There's that. Well, they all signed that um that what? petition to Torpedo. You know what I'm talking about, Eric? Yeah. The the against the age of consent law. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh really? There's like a ton of them. Yeah. Yeah. Atari um was Sartre in there as well? Yeah, Sartre. Yeah. Sartre, yeah. uh Foucault. Right. Uh no surprise from Foucault to be honest though. Yeah, so it was I think it was kind of like yeah, not yeah, that's true. Oh well that's kind of yeah, the Foucault. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. Yeah. That's a little creepy. Yeah, well, Foucault had some I don't know there's uh I don't know if this has been like proven, but there's kind of like some people are saying that there's evidence that Foucault was like uh like a uh like a I don't know like a pedophile or something. I'm not sure uh if that's been substantiated, but I don't know. Well, er, an earlier uh an earlier group of Europeans uh, artists, not so much philosophers. But I don't know if you knew that um, Charlie Chaplin liked him young, and um, but they were old enough that I don't think it was illegal, but it was close. Um, and one woman, after she divorced Chaplin, wrote a book, and like all of the the artists of Europe just dumped on her and just said oh well she she knew she was attractive and she came on to him and and you know I mean what can you do you know and and basically it was like they made this like 17 year old a femme fatale uh and ensnaring this man and what and, and she was not 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 a good person like like blaming Lewinsky for what happened to her mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. And then, and then, even look what happened with uh, m much closer to now, Woody Allen, and mm -hmm. his, um, and one of his uh, stepdaughters. Stepdaughter, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you want to re see, a, 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 it's disturbing, but it's a interesting documentary. Um, why am I forgetting the last name? Uh, Pharaoh. Um, it's the it's the it's the stepson of of Alan, Mia Farrow's son, I think, from a previous marriage, and he actually did a documentary on it. And I just the one clip I remember uh, was why was there? I guess it was the young woman who's now older, but but saying why was there the presumption that I would be lying about everything. Right. I mean, it was just like it, it, she said it was just I, I mean, I understand I'm a human being and yes, I make mistakes and I'm not perfect. Um, but why was there just this monolithic just antagonism to me that there was no way that anything I possibly could have said ever could have any little bit of truth to it. And that's the thing that 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 bothered her uh, a lot saying, you know what. Anyway, so if if you have a. I mean, I know you're all we're all busy, but if you if you do stumble over it, it's it's something that's really disturbing. And it look at Weinstein. I mean, it just it, it you know the more you look at this stuff, the more you're thinking. You just get a sick feeling in your stomach, like you know what what when go backwards, right? The so-called uh, what was it called? The couch. Um, what do you call uh, the couch uh, audition? And, you know, huge names in Hollywood, like David Selznick uh, and others who in the public mind don't come across as disgustingly creepy as Weinstein, where every bit is bad. You know, basically saying, hey, you want you want a starring role? You're the euphemism. You're sleeping with me. And uh, and it was incredibly rife uh, in, 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 in Hollywood. So yeah. Spinoza's right. Well, I think Spinoza would be able to answer that question about why is everyone against me because I've I've denounced you know this 
this famous Hollywood actor or whatnot, um, I think Spinoza would be able to answer that. Say, yeah, if you're causing, you know, sadness in the object of love that will give you, uh, you'll be the object of hatred then. But um, how dare yeah. you undermine my view of, of someone who I really respect? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I also the, the business about affects overriding reason, that that whole thing, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so for specifically for philosophy, just, that's the thing I constantly having to read and think about and whatnot. So uh, I don't know. There's something about like a an, for some reason actors or something doesn't surprise me too much. But then philosophers, I don't know. Maybe people like a, a different standard for them, or at least because I think I'm, I'm like uh, you know, maybe I am I one. I don't know. Maybe I am. So there's a little more like skin in the game, maybe. But you know, we've so Western philosophy. We've got this whole kind of tradition we get from the greeks and they've got this practice of uh pederasty or whatnot and it's kind of like i mean i don't know it's like never you you teach this like every semester pretty much right and you have to explain like yeah they did stuff with little boys they liked little boys like well, well i mean but it was it was weird it was a very specific age group you know, it was it wasn't eight nine year olds. It was adolescents who were beginning to be adult. It was like a like a three year, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, something like that. And it was the whole part. And it was from from everything I've read is the whole idea was the totality of an education of a young man. So it was poetry, it was music, it was, begging your pardon, I don't want to say art of love, but I mean, that that would be the kind of language that that they would have used. Um, Although, you know, in the symposium, it's been a long time since I read that, but, um, you know, he argues that, I'll actually in the, in the Republic too, to some degree, that that sexual love gets in the way of so the, I, actually, in the in the Republic, he he says something about the, the the teacher should treat his students like a father, you know, not as a lover. And I and I I think it's because the sexual relationship gets in the way of you know, like we were talking earlier of this pursuit of the passion of reason. So, you know, I, I use that as an excuse to skirt the issue, you know, because I mean, I will say, you know, sometimes the, you know, uh, homosexuality was very prevalent in ancient Greece. And in fact, you know, they, they in general thought of women as defective men. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're better off having sex with young men than you are with women. But, um, but then, you know, Plato seems to suggest that that uh, sensuality tends to be a distraction from the pursuit of philosophy. So that's kind of the way I kind of yeah. If hurt the though, issue, uh, he talks a lot about this in the history of sexuality. Uh, I think what is it the volume three? I think it is talking about Foucault. Yeah, so Foucault he wrote a lot about so the history of sexuality, and yeah. in the third volume, it's about uh ancient greek and roman philosophy and he goes into yeah quite a bit of detail on stuff like that explaining kind of like their cultural practices and how they had this kind of like art of uh composing the self and whatnot and it, uh, it's pretty interesting i haven't read the whole thing i've just read parts but um i don't know still kind of Foucault, I don't, I don't know. Hmm. I can't get that. Terrible, also a terrible person. Uh, yeah, that's what rumors, rumors say that. Yeah, although I, I think in this case it's just, it's just like it's rumors in the sense it, it could be true, it could not. So I don't, I don't want to condemn Foucault. 
but I mean, I think I like Foucault a lot. Is his actual philosophy, but um, yeah. So I, I, for reasons that Spinoza could easily explain, I, I don't want it to be true. <laughs> See ya. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so it's what time is it? Yeah, we're 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 way over time, so you you can feel just fine with my Zoom. I can't. It's just like totally fucking up. Are you clicking on the chat and it won't it won't appear on the side? Oh my god, I just figured it out. It's Bizzle's in full screen or something? What the oh oh my god. Okay. Hmm. Online yeah, when I... it's in full screen, the chat window pops up as a separate window. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what was happening. And for some reason it's never done that to me before, so I had no idea what's going on. Okay. Now I do. Well, Chase, I'm sorry that uh, some of these have been exhausting for you. Um, yeah, I'll I'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, I I very much appreciate your, you know, your 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 work and your your persistence. So, uh, thank you. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry that it can be burdensome sometimes because I'm glad you're here. Right. Yeah, I think I think overall uh, I am too. I, I I still like these. I like these seminars. I want to keep doing them. I don't know. I'm kind of do Chopin.